good afternoon. I'm Fraser Miller, Institutional Sales Trader for PSG Securities. The topic for today is why a strong rand presents opportunities to go offshore now. I will discuss this topic by way of three points. First of all, geographic diversification. The second is the sectors and shares not available in South Africa. And the last one will be the best way to take money offshore. Just for comparison reasons, just to keep it simple, all my examples will be based on the US market and the US dollar versus the South African market and the South African rand. So the topic for today is around a strong rand. So let's have a quick look at the reasons why the rand is stronger from the weak levels we saw at the end of 2015. A point to note is that, like I said, the RAND is stronger and it's not strong. We need to look at these levels, it's bounced back from, and why it weakened to those levels. Getting back to the stronger versus strong RAND. The best and the, the good way and the best way to measure where the RAND should be is by, virtue, by way of uh, the purchasing power parity, the PPP. This is an economic theory that compares different countries' currencies through a market basket of goods approach. According to this concept, two currencies are in equilibrium or at par when a market basket of goods is priced the same in both countries. So looking at the PPP currently for, for the rand against the dollar is roughly between 11 rand 50, close to 11 and 50. And this is taking it over a time frame since 1994, the start of our democracy. If we measure this back, for instance, to 1974, just after the oil crisis, the PPP is estimated to be roughly around about 9 Rand 50 to the US dollar. So my point, I'm saying the Rand is, if the Rand was at or below 11 Rand 50, we could, have, we could have argued, yes, we've got a strong Rand, but because it's not there, but it's much better from the, 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 the worst levels that we saw at the end of 2015 from 1791, that's why we say the Rand is stronger. Looking back at what, what was the reasons. Now of late, we've seen the market has given us a few new terminologies, which impact the currency market quite dramatically. Um, things like Nenegate and Brexit, and now the latest one, Trumponomics. Nenegate happened in December 2015, when rumors of the cabinet shuffle came true. The finance minister was fired and replaced by an unknown member of ANC, Des van Rooyen. Three days later, he was replaced by the previous finance minister, Pravin Gordon. The RAND, which was already in a bit of a slide up to December, fell an estimate of between 13 and 15 percent, depending on what time you measure it, in two days to a low of 1791. Since then, Minister Gordon came in and tried to steady the ship. We've also seen a recovery in commodities, which is always good for the RAND. So the commodity prices started recovering in 2016 and under Minister Gordon, we managed to avoid a possible investment downgrade. So these are all factors that started um, helping the RAND to strengthen from those worst oversold levels that we saw at the end of 2015. Uh, just a comparison, the RAND strengthened against the pound as well, and that is due to Brexit, uh, where the UK um, decided that they want to exit the European Union. And as we speak today on the 29th of March, the Minister Theresa May will trigger Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, and that will start the proceeds for the two year long to, to exit um, Britain from the, from the Eurozone. Um, this, um, so the question was why the strong RAND presents opportunities to go offshore? Well, there's the, the ample, pretty simple. It's cheap to invest offshore now. It's by way of a, a small example here, if you bought 100 Apple shares at $140, um, that transaction at 17 Rand to the dollar would cost you 238,000 Rand. The very same transaction at the, with the Rand at 13 Rand to the dollar would cost 182,000 Rand, a 56,000 Rand difference. So there we can see that you use less Rands to buy US dollars with the stronger Rand. Brings me to the first point that we, we will discuss, and that is geographical diversification. I found this uh, quote by Fujiu Mitarai. He's a Japanese um, gentleman. He's currently the CEO and chairman of Canon Incorporated, a 40 billion market cap company. In 1961, he started working for the company and he was very instrumental in the turnaround of Canon in the US. Uh, currently, Canon is the number 84 on the most valuable brand list, according to the list compiled by Forbes at the end of 2016, and is mentioned in the same group of companies as Sony, Panasonic, and HP. 
So I want to just break up this ge geographical diversification, a quick definition of diversification. It's the practice of diversifying an investment portfolio across different geographic regions so as to reduce the overall risk and improve returns on the portfolio. Um, looking at geographical, as with diversification in general, geographical diversification is based on the premise that financial markets in different parts of the world may not be highly correlated with one another. For example, if the US and European stock markets are declining because their economies are in recession, an investor may choose to allocate part of its portfolio to emerging economies with higher growth rates such as China, Brazil or South Africa. So simple terms, it is when you spread your risk outside the South African universe. Very important to note here that investing offshore for the longer term is that your investment might be affected by short term volatility in the currency. So don't base your investment decision on the currency, base it on fundamentals of the company you invest in. Once again, a small example, you buy a share in the US that gains 5%, but the dollar weakens uh, because of something that happens in the US, Trumponomics, and the dollar weakens by 6%, you're worse off. As I mentioned before, in extreme cases, investors may want to take advantage of mispricing um, to, to, to take money offshore and be ready for an investment um, on the other side. The world is a much bigger place than South Africa. On this slide, I've just listed the top 10 brands by value, also compiled by Forbes in 2016. You can see the Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Coca-Cola, Toyota, IBM, Disney, McDonald's, and General Electric. Point to note there, the, this, this is the top 10 out of a list of top 100 names. Not a single South African name that's listed in South Africa make, made this, this 100 list. So, second point we're looking at, shares and sectors not available in South Africa. First of all, just, let's just look at the, the markets. The South Africa market, the JSE, we've got just over 400 listed shares um, in the three categories, ZA01, ZA02, ZA03. These are the, the, the classifications from the JSE. ZA03 is basically your very un, un, untradable, very illiquid shares. Um, so I think only about 300 shares really investable in South Africa out of this list. But scary to note that five shares make up 46% of the total market cap. Those are British American Tobacco, BHP Billiton, Naspers, Glencore and Richmond. Compare that to the US with over 3,500 shares listed in all the various indices. The Dow Jones Industrial Index is just top 30, the top 30 stocks. The Dow is a price-weighted average of 30 significant stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. It was founded in 1896 by the founders Charles Dow and his partner Edward Jones. Um, they launched it with only 12 companies, uh, were almost purely industrial in nature. The first components operated in railroads, cotton, gas, sugar, tobacco and oil. The only share that is still a part of the Dow component is General Electric. Um, since, 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 since the inception till now. Then you've got the S&P 500, which is, the, which is 500 shares, compiles of just over 500 shares with market caps of only over $20 billion. Then there's the Russell 3000 index, which is split into the Russell 1000, which is uh, 1,000 shares with a market cap between 5 and $20 billion. And then the Russell 2000 index, which is also known as the small cap index, um, that's, that index comprises of 2,000 shares with market cap of smaller than $5 billion. On this slide, I just um, quickly to note, that's the 30 shares that's listed uh, on the Dow 30, the, the components. You can see them all there from American Express all the way down uh, to Walmart. Very interesting, the, the, the most recent change that took part in this index was in March 19, 2015, when Apple replaced AT&T in this component. Uh, the sectors that is not listed and, and, and shares, the first one that comes to mind is the utility sector. The utility sector is a category of stocks for utilities such as gas and power. Uh, this sector contains companies such as electric, gas and water firms and in integrated providers. Because utilities require significant infrastructure, these firms often carry large amounts of debt. 
with a high debt load, utility companies become sensitive to changes in the interest rates. Now, if you look at South Africa, if you look at a utility company, we've got ESCOM, which is not listed. So for a South African to invest in utilities, you've only got, you've only way of investing is looking offshore. Um, the utility sector is also a bit of a um, hedge against interest rates. In times of low interest rates in the US, uh, investors tend to, to look, look further and to buy utility shares. The second one that comes to mind is the semiconductor sector. This sector is a is uh, material products, usually comprises of silicon, which conducts electricity more than an insulator, but less than a pure conductor, such as copper and aluminum. Semiconductors are usually very small and complex devices and can be found in thousands of products, such as computers, cell phones, appliances, and medical equipment. We have not got the sector in South Africa. We've got no companies like the likes of Samsung, Texas Instruments, and Intel. And then the last one maybe to mention is a company called Denel. Denel is a company also not listed in South Africa. It's the only company that we've really got that would fit in like an aerospace index. In the US, you've got quite a few. You've got uh, Boeing, you've got Texton, you've got Rockwell. Texton is the makers of Cessna and Beechcraft jets, and then also Bell helicopters. So the third point, like I said, the best way to take your money offshore. There we're just looking at the benefits of the asset swap facility or the offshore allowance. This, um, first of all, look, let's look at the asset swap. Um, you don't need any tax clearance to get your money offshore. You've got, it's an unlimited amount that you can take to invest offshore. You can invest uh, by way of a trust or yourself as an individual or in a company. You, at the end of your investment, whenever you decide to sell your investment, you have to repatriate that money. And then in the, in the time of death, there is no offshore inheritance tax for the individual or on the company or the trust uh, that, 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 will, that will only be, trust, only be taxed in South Africa. If you look at the, the offshore allowance, you must get tax clearance before you want to take your money offshore. You've only got 10 million per annum per person, plus your million travel allowance per year. These are only for the individuals over 18. Once you've got the money offshore on the, and you've got your class tax clearance and you've moved your money offshore, yeah, there's no need to repatriate back to South Africa. You can sell your investment. You can move it to other countries offshore. Uh, but there, in times of death, there's inheritance tax on both sides, meaning in offshore and locally, you will be tax on that uh, money. So to conclude, the world is a bigger place with more opportunities. That slide shows straight, clearly there, stocks, there's over 60,000 shares traded globally. South Africa, the 300 shares, as I mentioned, on funds, there's over 200,000 funds to invest in. South Africa, we've got 1,300 funds. So the rand is attractive at these levels currently. Is there any questions? All right, the questions are coming through. Just give me a sec. I just want to read through them. I've got a question here from Jabula. Uh, can I borrow against my asset swap account at PSG? Uh, no, unfortunately not. You cannot. AJ Kruger. If there are any tanks, what is the chance that the Reserve Bank will reduce the asset swap facilities? It won't reduce it. I've got a question here from Mr. Kruger. If the RAND really tanks, what is the chance that the Reserve Bank will reduce uh, the asset swap facility? Um, I don't think there's a chance of that, but I mean, once again, I'm, uh, I'm not an economist and, 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 and I think that's something to maybe discuss with the, uh, uh, with the Reserve Bank or an economist that's close to them. I've got a, a, a question here from Howard. How does one open a account for overseas trading. Um, I will show that on the next slide.
And I've got one more here from Jabula again. Are you going to share your presentation with us? Yes, we will. It will be emailed to you. Um, if there's any other questions that I've missed here, um, you're very welcome. Um, further on in the slides, you're very welcome to send me an email or contact me. I will gladly discuss any questions that I've missed. So the next action steps, uh, Howard, there we go. You can register on PSG Wealth Offshore account. You can click on that on, this, on the slide. Uh, like I said, the webinar PDF and recordings will be sent to you. Please complete the survey. Uh, and then for any queries, there is a number, 0868 number if you want to call, or my direct number and my email address. Um, I'll gladly answer your questions. Thank you very much.